Acts 4, verse 1 to 22. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the, temple, the, ca- temple, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection from the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them into jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. And so the number of people, men who believed, now totaled about 5,000. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of the religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power and whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, we are, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, The stone that you build is rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men, they asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from speaking and spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of the man who had been lame for more than 40 years. So what's the best way we can show love to people in our community, people around us? We actually had a a good chat with a friend of ours here the other day, me and Denise, and and he was super excited. He couldn't, he couldn't, uh, um, he could hardly contain himself. It was his 21st anniversary that day that we happened to be talking to him. He just could not wait to get out and uh, get his wife some flowers and surprise her with that. And then they were going out for a special, uh, special anniversary dinner. And so that's how he was wanting to show love for his wife. So how do we show love to those who, sh- who, who love us? Might be spouses or kids or whatever. But the harder question is, how do we show love to those who don't love us? Maybe sometimes we could tell them about Jesus. But how do we love others by doing that if they don't agree with us? Well, the Apostle Peter is going to help us with that today. uh, As he loves a variety of people enough to tell them about who Jesus is. Now, Jesus had sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And he now lived in each of the believers. Strengthening them to follow Jesus and tell others about him as he had commanded them to. Back in Acts 1.8, he said to them, You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's what the apostles were doing. They were being his witnesses. Shortly after after Pentecost, the apostles Peter and John encountered a man who had been lame from birth, who had never walked. And he was begging for money at the temple. But Peter, Peter didn't give him any money. Instead, he helped them physically. He healed them instantly um, through Jesus Christ. Many people were in the temple and they recognized the beggar. And they now saw him walking, leaping and praising God and causing a commotion, which was great. And the people gathered around Peter and the healed man. And Peter told them that Jesus was the one who healed them. 
that healed him, sorry. And of course, the crowds were just amazed because they knew this guy. But there were some others who also noticed the commotion. They heard Peter's message and they didn't like it. The leaders were disturbed. Acts 4 verses 1 to 3 picks up right away after that event. It says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, still speaking to the people that had gathered there, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection from the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them into jail until the morning. The leaders obviously didn't like hearing that God would raise people from the dead through Jesus Christ. Since most of those leaders were actually Sadducees, that's actually not all that surprising, but you might wonder, well, who's the Sadducees? Why does that matter? Well, the Sadducees were both a political and a religious group that included most of the priests were part of that group. They were what you would call religious liberals. They weren't religious conservatives believing everything the Bible was teaching kind of thing. They only believed that the first five books in the Bible, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch as we call it, or the Torah, depending, all the same thing. The first five books of Moses, they believed those were authoritative and the rest, they didn't. They denied any kind of life after death. So a hope of a resurrection was not their belief. So hearing about Jesus' resurrection disturbed them. So they had the apostles arrested. The captain of the temple guard that's mentioned there worked under the authority of the priests and their job was to keep order in the temple. So he's the guy that would have arrested Peter and John. The leader's reaction might be kind of surprising to us. I mean, the resurrection of Jesus was well known at this point. Um, and he had even been seen by hundreds of people when he was appearing to people um, before he ascended to heaven. Now we have this guy who was crippled from birth walking around. And you would think that would convince the leaders that Jesus really was the Messiah. But it probably really didn't surprise the disciples that they didn't believe that. Jesus received a lot of opposition while he was on earth and doing his teaching and ministering and doing miracles. And, uh, and he even told his disciples, they're going to get opposition. But why? Why would there be this kind of opposition? Um, it seems, you know, kind of ridiculous in a lot of ways. I mean, if God's the creator of this world and he's supposed to be all powerful, why doesn't he just change it? I mean, we see this kind of stuff today, even still. Why does he let this kind of stuff happen? Well, basically, since people rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, mankind in the world is in a fallen state, fallen from perfection, basically meaning that. People are spe especially are living in separation and rebellion against God. And Jesus, when he was uh, speaking to an unbelieving crowd that was listening to him, he told them, I'm going to go to John chapter 8, he told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. You are of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell the truth, you naturally don't believe me. Now, that's not just the state of the few people that were talking with Jesus when he says, you are the you're, you're, you're actually children of your father, the devil. This is really anybody who is not yet a follower of Jesus. That was me at one point. Because what we want to do is what God sees as evil. What we naturally say, hey, I want to do this. It's thing, often things that God looks at and says, that's an evil thing. We didn't, I didn't love God or Jesus and didn't like it when I heard the truth. God has to change our hearts and our minds so that we will listen gladly to and believe the truth. Jesus continued in verse 47 of John 8. And he says, anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. So how do we change so that we listen to the truth so that we belong to God? Only the Holy Spirit working in each of us so that we are not blind and deaf to God's word can do that. John 6, 44 says, For no one can come to me unless... 
The Father who sent me draws them to me. When God opens our understanding and we know these things to be true, we know that we are separated from God, that we are sinful people. We believe what God says about our sinfulness. Then he says to us, he tells us to repent, to turn from our sins and confess them to God. Then we put our trust in Jesus alone, that his death on the cross paid the penalty for our sin and wipes away our guilt. And then we commit our lives to follow Jesus. And all of that is what it means to believe in Jesus. It means to repent, to trust, to commit ourselves to him. And then God, on his part, makes us his children. We belong to him, and we no longer belong to the world. So, we become what the world hates, because we're now different, and we belong to God. So this attitude of opposition that the leaders um, give to Peter and John, we're facing today, that's why it came. That's why it was there. But a lot of the people that Peter and John were talking to, they didn't feel the same way as those leaders did. They responded positively to the message. This is Acts 4.4. It says, but many of the people who heard the message, uh, heard their message, believed it. And so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. Isn't that great to see? 5,000. And and that's only the men. So it's got to be over twice that. God was powerfully using the message of Jesus that Peter spoke to the crowd. And God, of course, still works today, bringing people to himself through one person telling another about Jesus. Because we love them enough to tell them. Some of us get a chance to preach. Not many of us. This is me here so far. And the rest of us, including me, we get to talk one-on-one with others. And it's God who works in people. And people still come to him today. But despite that, Peter and John spent the night in prison, in spite of the fact that uh, all those people believed. How did they love those who opposed them? We're going to see some general things for us to keep in mind. And I say they're general because every situation that you face will be different. But we're going to see some things that they do that are going to be helpful to us. So verse 5 of chapter 4 of Acts. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of the religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other relatives of the high priest. So that council is what's known as the Sanhedrin. And aside from the Romans, they were the governing body for the people of Israel. And it comprised of 71 people. The first guy, the chairman, if you want to call it, was the high priest. The rest of the 70 other members were made up of chief priests, and you see some of them listed here. It was made up also of elders, which are influential lay people, so they're not priests. And it was made up of teachers of religious law, both people who were Sadducees and people who were Pharisees. Those two different religious groups that were common at the time of Christ. So Annas and Caiaphas, you may or may not remember them, but they were noted in the book of Matthew and the book of John, as the actual guys who tried Jesus. They thought they got rid of him and his teaching, but things are not quieting down. Now they have to deal with Jesus' followers. So in verse 7, they brought, out, they brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power and in whose name have you done this? Now Peter had a choice here. He could have just said, Oh, so sorry for bothering you guys. We'll just go back to Galilee and go fishing and stay safe. Or he could love these people enough to risk telling them about Jesus. The only way that those people, those leaders, would have of escaping the wrath of God for their sins is to trust the sacrifice of Jesus that he made for them. So does Peter take the risk? Does he love those people? Does he be honest? Does he tell them the truth? Well, let's see how Peter answers. And, we'll, and, and we will see then what to do when we face people who don't agree with us, but who still need Jesus. Verse 8 and 9. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? The first thing that was said there was, uh, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's important. This is a very different Peter than the one 
who when Jesus was tried, he denied Jesus. And when he was confronted during Jesus' trial, the filling of the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. Being filled with the Spirit here describes how Peter was controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so he was able to answer in a powerful way. Peter and John had spent the night in jail and no doubt had been also deep in prayer about how to face this council in the morning. The first and most, more, most important thing when we love people enough to tell them about Jesus is to pray. We need to depend on God for his wisdom and strength. And so we pray. It doesn't say they prayed, but we can well imagine that's what they were doing. That's what we see them doing very often. The second thing we see Peter doing, though, is speaking respectfully. Speaking respectfully to the council. In this case, these leaders, uh, these are the leaders of the people, even though they are directly opposed to what God is doing. Scripture again and again throughout it states that we are to show respect to leaders of any kind, especially government people. Exodus 22, 28 is only one example. It says, you must not dishonor God or curse any of your rulers. This is something actually the Apostle Paul quoted uh, when he was being uh, interrogated by the chief priest. And yes, that includes our government leaders as much as we may not like them. I mean, think about it. Jesus himself was being interrogated by a Roman governor by the name of Pilate, and he was straightforward and respectful even to him. The king of kings was respectful even to Pontius Pilate when he was tried by him. The apostle Paul, we see him give us many examples of being tried and speaking respectfully to those who were examining him on trial. There was no put downs. There was no negative comments that would make funny memes. I mean, can you just imagine Peter and, you know, Peter and Paul scrolling through their phone, their social media, um, showing each other captioned and photoshopped uh, pictures of Annas and Caiaphas and going, hey, look at this. That's another good one. Oh, isn't that funny? No, they tell us to pray for the leaders. They want Peter and Paul, uh, Paul, they want the leaders to come to know Jesus. They love them. So Peter addresses these leaders respectfully but also clearly. Verse 10. Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Peter immediately directs them to Jesus. He didn't hesitate to and water or water down the truth. Jesus didn't do that, and neither does Peter. And of course, neither should we. The truth of the gospel is offensive. People don't like hearing that they've sinned against God and deserve God's punishment for their sin. People don't like to hear that. But if people don't know that, they won't understand why Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was necessary and is actually good news. Peter was very clear and respect, respectful about the truth of Jesus. Yes, the one they had crucified, but whom God had raised. The resurrection power of Jesus healed that man. Now that group was directly responsible for Jesus' death. They turned him over to the Romans and condemned him to death. But Peter wants them to know that they didn't get rid of him at all. God raised him, and that resurrection life is now in his people. And that's the heart of the gospel that they proclaimed to him, the resurrection of Jesus. Peter adds to his evidence, this is a number of, uh, four, I think, by using scripture, showing Jesus is a prophet, was the prophesied Messiah. Verse uh, 11, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you build is rejected has now become the cornerstone. He's quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. And this relates very directly to the Sanhedrin, to that council. They were the ones who rejected Jesus, not realizing he was the one that God had actually sent to be the foundation of his kingdom. So that was exactly what they had done. When we speak using scripture, it it's becomes the authority, not ourselves. Our opinion is meaningless. Um, scripture is the best authority. God's word by itself is trustworthy, 
uh, truthful and powerful, and the Holy Spirit uses it to communicate God's truth. Which is why, of course, we need to know our Bibles, especially verses that help people understand the gospel. And we need to be ready to use them when the Holy Spirit gives us openings. So, along with praying, speaking respectfully, speaking clearly, and using scripture, we also need to love people enough to tell them that salvation is in Jesus alone. Verse 12. This is a verse all of us should memorize. If you have not memorized this, you should memorize this verse. It's very, that important. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. For these Jewish leaders, they had rejected and they're continuing to reject Jesus as their Messiah. Peter is clearly declaring Jesus as the only Savior whom God has given because God declares it. It's pretty bold of Peter, if you think about it, to say this to people who believe differently than him. It can also be a hard thing to say in our society for us as well, because this is an exclusive claim of truth. You will hear it very often that, uh, well, what makes you think you know the, the truth, that you have the, the one claim to truth? Well, we do. Salvation, rescue from the penalty, power, and presence of sin is only found in Jesus Christ. It is not found anywhere else. If we really love people, we must say it. We must say it lovingly, respectfully, and clearly. Everything else is a lie. And it does not result in people being saved from their sins and reconciled to God. If people don't do that, if people don't come to Jesus, the Bible teaches they will spend eternity separated from God in hell. Do we love people enough to tell them that? John 14, 6, Jesus told him, speaking to someone else, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It isn't our opinion that Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus himself said it. No one can come to the Father except through him. There is no other way. So that's why we have to say it. If people reject the message, remember it's Jesus they're rejecting. God is the one who gives people that option. Jesus didn't force people to believe, and we can't either. Our duty is to tell it prayerfully, respectfully, clearly, using scripture, and declaring salvation is through faith in Jesus alone. Then we will leave the results up to the Holy Spirit. The message is exclusive, but it's also inclusive. It extends to absolutely everybody. Jesus will save anyone, but we must be saved through him. So the reaction of those who hear is their responsibility. Let's see how the council reacted, verse 13 to 15. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the excuse me, out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. I like this. You do not have to be a biblical scholar to tell others about Jesus. Did you notice the disciples were ordinary people? Just like you, just like me. God uses ordinary people to spread the good news about Jesus. Notice as well that, the, that these were people who had been with Jesus. Their relationship with and their love for Jesus is what flowed out of them. We don't need special training to tell our friends and neighbors about what Jesus has done for us. Yes, it is good to know some verses and to have learned what's important to say to help people understand the gospel. But most important and underlying it all is our love for Jesus. This grows out of the time we spend with him and gives boldness when we talk about him. We love Jesus. We want others to know about it. The council wasn't happy with the situation, but there really wasn't anything the council could say. The truth was plain and clear in front of them. 
even if they didn't like it. So they tried a common tactic to intimidate them into silence and compromise. Verse 16. What should we do with this man? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them to not, sp- not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them to never again speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Now the council did have power and persuasion in their society, so they tried to intimidate the apostles. But really, there was no teeth in their warning. There were really no consequences. But notice something important. They don't even try to disprove the main evidence of Peter, which was the resurrection of Jesus. Remember, at the very beginning, this was the main thing that bothered them. It bothered them that they were teaching people about the resurrection of Jesus. And that's actually really strong support uh, in favor of the resurrection. The fact of Jesus' life and resurrection is one of the most historical, verifiable facts of history. If you want to learn more about that evidence, talk to Denise and myself, and we can point you to some good resources. But with that man standing there in front of them, they could not and dared not try to disprove it. So, they resort to intimidation instead. This shows they really didn't want to know the truth about who Jesus is. If they did, they would have wanted to discuss it some more. When we talk to people, their response to us lets us know if the Holy Spirit is working in them or not, and if it's wise to continue to talk to them at that time or not. If someone's open to the Holy Spirit, they'll continue to discuss about Jesus, even if it's in a questioning or even oppositional kind of terms. If they try to shut us down, then there's really no point in continuing the conversation with that person at that time. Maybe later, who knows? But we continue to pray. So what should be our reaction if people don't want to listen? We move on, but we continue to spread the truth of the gospel. Let's see what the apostle said in verse 19 and 20. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Pretty powerful words there. Their love for Jesus drives them to tell everyone about him. They cannot stop, as it says there. Jesus told them in Acts 1.8, which I read in the beginning, you will be my witnesses, and they are. They are so excited about Jesus, what he has done for them, they have to tell people about him. For these disciples and for us, the foundation of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus. They had seen it. And they were witnesses to it, and they would end up going to their deaths eventually, proclaiming that. Because they loved Jesus, and because they loved the people that they were telling about him. But their deaths at this point are a long ways down the road for the disciples. For now, all the council could do was threaten them. Verse 21. The council then threatened them with further. But they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of the man who had been lame for more than 40 years. So this is the start of the New Testament church. And the disciples are so excited about what Jesus has done for them, they are telling everyone, literally. Jesus even gave them the ability to perform miraculous signs so that their message would have the obvious backing of God. They loved that crippled man that they saw enough that they healed him. More importantly, they loved the people around them enough to tell them about Jesus. They even loved the leaders who jailed them enough to respectfully, but clearly, show them the truth. Because, they were respo- because those leaders were responsible for Jesus' death and they needed to believe in Jesus to be saved from God's punishment. The apostles could have backed down And they could have gone fishing. They could have decided this was too hard, this was too scary. But they didn't. They loved all the people enough to tell them the truth. So do we. Do we love our family, our friends, our neighbors enough to tell them about Jesus? 
Have we spent the time to learn what, the, what these people need to understand and figured out ways to tell them and even some verses we could use? Are we praying for the Holy Spirit to be working in their lives to open them to the truth? And I would challenge you, pray for two people consistently every day, just two people that are important to you in some way that you can, that they would come to know the truth and then pray for them, pray for openings to speak to them about Jesus. Peter and John loved Jesus and were excited about what he had done. They also loved the people around them. They loved them enough to pray for them and then respectfully and clearly tell them the truth about Jesus, even those leaders that were opposing them. They were committed enough to continue to tell others, even when they hit that opposition. Do we love Jesus enough to do the same? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this um, expression of love of these guys. They could have just said nothing and carried on, and, but they boldly and clearly and lovingly and respectfully spoke to these leaders. Father, we may not ever be in that situation, or we might be, but we also have friends and neighbors, uh, relatives that um, we need to talk to about Jesus. And help us to do that wisely. Help us to do these things that we've been talking about, looking at their example as we pray, as we speak respectfully, as we speak clearly, as we tell the truth about who Jesus is. Help us to do that you know, in, those, in that kind of a way. Father, give us a hearing. Bring people to know you. Bring people to come to know you and to follow you that don't know you. And we pray that you'll help us to be obedient in whatever way that you are telling us to do. Help us to put into practice what we are hearing this morning, what the, looking at what the apostles have done. So thank you so much that you are at work, that you brought at that point 5,000 people, and you are still bringing people to come to know you. You are great, and we worship you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.